Well, good morning. We are going to take a little break from Matthew. I like to do that. I like to mix it up every now and then. Uh, whenever we get to different sections, uh, I like to kind of do the foundation of faith and go through some foundational uh, ideas, uh, foundational sermons that I think are really important for us to grow. Uh, and so we're going to be studying primarily from Colossians chapter 2 this morning. Uh, and as I said, just to kind of mix it up a little bit. But we're also going to be looking at a couple other verses before we get to Colossians 2. So if you go ahead and turn there and put your ribbon there, we'll be at Colossians 2 in just a few moments. Um, last week we looked at Matthew and we saw how Jesus describes the emptiness, right? The empty house uh, where a demon has been cast out and then it goes in waterless places seeking somewhere to live and then it thinks, well, I'll just go back to the place where I was, uh, where I was cast out, my old home, and he returns and he finds that it's clean and swept and he goes and gets seven friends and they all come and live in the body. And we kind of talked about how emptiness is a breeding ground for wickedness and we don't want to be empty. Um, as I was preparing that sermon and, and after speaking to others after preaching that sermon, I, I felt like emptiness is uh, probably a common reality inside of us. Uh, it's something that occasionally pops up and occasionally has to be fought against. Um, how do we feel full in Christ? Uh, if you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for a long time, have you gone through periods of feeling as though you're empty, uh, as though you don't have what you need, as though there's something more that you, you, you're pursuing or going after because what you have just doesn't feel like enough? Um, I think all, all of us have probably gone through that uh, on some level, uh, and we can understand the, the difficulty. Uh, but there's some, there's some cases, sometimes, when maybe we get used to that emptiness and we just assume that's just the norm. That's just the way things are supposed to be, and it's okay, and it's fine. But really, it's not. Um, really, God has, has given us something that is supposed to help us feel full, help us feel satisfied. So we're, this morning, going to just start thinking about this a little bit and looking at a couple of texts to try to understand how we can feel full and satisfied. Whenever those feelings of emptiness come, we can then look to these ideas, hopefully that we study this morning, and find satisfaction, find the fullness that God wants to be inside of all of us. As we study scriptures, we see that mankind is constantly searching for this one thing to satisfy our craving. A uh, passage that always comes to mind about this is, is Ecclesiastes. If you studied uh, Ecclesiastes at all, you know that's exactly what Solomon, the wisest man to have lived on the earth, uh, was going through. He was seeking something, some source of satisfaction. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 16, it says, I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience and wisdom of knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after wind. So he's searching for some value in his wisdom. He's searching for value in madness. He's searching for value in folly. And he says it's all striving after wind. Verse 18, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom. And how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works, I built houses, I implanted vineyards for myself, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in, in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which the water of the 
the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who were before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eye desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toils. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun." This just comes to my mind any time I think about emptiness, any time I think about trying to find satisfaction, trying to find fulfillment. Here's a man who has everything at his disposal. He's the richest, wisest man to have ever lived. He can do anything his heart desires. And he has it all. He's got the gold, he's got the silver, he's got the stuff, he's got the people, he's got everything. And he looks at it all and says, it's like trying to reach out and grab that wind and hold on to it. That's what I'm doing. As I'm going after all of these things, I'm grabbing onto something that cannot be held on to. There is no satisfaction found there. It doesn't last. It's empty. Go to chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes. And he says, he says it like this. He says, I turned my heart to know and search out and to seek wisdom in the scheme of things. Notice this phrase, scheme of things. And to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher. It's what Solomon calls himself. While adding one thing to another, define the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes." I like this text as well. It's not really a commonly referred to text in Ecclesiastes, but he points out, essentially describes what it is he's been doing. He's trying to find the scheme. He's trying to find the path that he must go in order to feel satisfied, in order to find fulfillment, in order uh, to have something that is lasting and that is, that is going to provide for him an eternal satisfaction. And, and, and notice what he looks at. After looking at all these pleasures and all these things he could buy and all these good and upright things, he even looks at sin. It's kind of like this last ditch resort. Well, I tried all these other things and they don't fill the void. I might as well try adultery, but we don't get the sense that he did. I mean, he's the king. He has a thousand wives. I don't know that he committed adultery like his father did. But he looks at that and, and that adultery is this thing that brings about death and not life, and he stays away from it. But in the end, he says, they're seeking schemes, some way to find satisfaction, some way to find fulfillment, and there's nothing on the earth that he has found that has given him what he's looking for. You know, as I've lived... 33 years now, had a birthday last week. As I've lived 33 years now, I've noticed uh, that my pursuits have been much like Solomon's. Pursuing something that does not satisfy. You get the new truck, you get the new car, you get the new house, you get the new toy, cell phone, whatever it is. And you think this should be the last one that I'll ever buy. It'll never wear out on me. It will be everything I ever wanted it to be, and I will be satisfied for the rest of my life. And that does not work out. <laughs> it never does. I pursue hobbies. 
thinking, oh yeah, this hobby is going to be great. This is going to be something I'll do for the rest of my life. I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to spend all this money on all this duck hunting gear. And I got my duck hunting dog and I'm good to go. And then I find out I don't like the taste of duck. So that didn't work out. Um, you know, there's just a number of things that, that we pursue and we put all this time and effort and money in only to find out it's not what we were hoping for. So what's the solution? Look at Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, God gives this invitation. I think I've brought this up about seven or eight times here. I'm probably going to bring it up a thousand more if I, li if I live and I stay here long enough. Isaiah 55, listen to this invitation. Verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. I love this text. This is one of my favorites. As he, as he offers this invitation, you hear these words. He says, come, you know, come on. If you're thirsty, if you're hungry, if you're missing out on that satisfaction, that fulfillment, come to me and buy without money, without price. I don't charge a thing for it. You just come and I'll give it to you. And then he asks this question. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And why do you labor so hard for that which does not satisfy? <laughs> this is what we do. We're working hard, not smart. <laughs> this is what we're doing. And he says, why are you doing that? These things don't give you what you're seeking. Come to me and listen to what I'm saying. And it will be delightful. Listen diligently to me. And eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. God is offering to every single man, woman on the earth the satisfaction that they're longing. That they're missing out on. Free of charge. No, you know, gotchas. It's available. And he says, you just need to come and, and listen to me, to my words, and find the satisfaction that your soul may live and that you may enter into an everlasting covenant, the covenant that I made with David. What an amazing offer he gives at this text. As we go into the New Testament what we see is that this invitation is explained to be Jesus. Jesus' life, Jesus' words, Jesus' teachings, Jesus' work, all and everything about Jesus is the bread that satisfies, that gives us life, that gives life to our soul. And we must listen and we must uh, attend to the things of Jesus in order to find the satisfaction and the fulfillment that we need. We're going to look at a text this morning in Colossians chapter 2 that helps us more fully understand this idea of satisfaction and fulfillment. Paul, in his letters, a number of times refers to this idea of finding fulfillment in Christ being made full in Christ. And so Colossians is a really interesting, fascinating, fantastic text to look at, to understand 
how Christ is the rich food that God offers to give to us. How Christ fills us and satisfies us and our needs. And it also explains what that does. If you're in Colossians, look with me first of all at chapter 1. And notice this in verse 24. This is Paul explaining his mission. Now, the Colossians are a new congregation that Paul has not actually created. He didn't go there on a missionary trip. Maybe uh, a a disciple of his from Ephesus went up to Colossae, Epaphras, and, and he instituted or created the church and created all the believers by teaching the gospel there. But listen to Paul as he explains to these new Christians his mission and what he's all about. In verse 24, he says... Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Now listen to some of the words that are being used here. This isn't one of those simple, you know, easy to decipher things. But after looking at Isaiah and understanding the invitation that God is trying to offer to mankind, now we look at this with maybe a little bit of a different light. Paul says, I am suffering to fill up what is lacking in you by making the word of God fully known to you. Is that not the same thing as Isaiah says? Come to me, listen diligently, find rich food that your soul may live. Now Paul's saying, I'm working, I'm striving diligently to give you the word of God that you might be filled, that you might not be lacking anything. Verse 28, Paul says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Paul here is describing his mission as as one of of filling up the body of Christ with the knowledge of God's word till they get to the point where they understand Christ so much that they are mature and that he presents them mature in Christ. Now, whenever we think about this picture, this idea of eating rich food, instead of the food that doesn't satisfy, I mean, we start thinking about that. If, If... You have a mama like me that tells you you don't need all that junk food. That stuff's not going to get you what you need. It's not giving you the nutrients. It's not giving you the protein. You need to eat this good food in order to grow right, in order to be strong. This is exactly what Paul is trying to get across. I have proclaimed Christ that you may be filled, that you may be satisfied, and then you may grow. So really the purpose of the rich food here, is not that we would just have a a feeling of satisfaction. This is what we're longing for. We're longing to feel satisfied, right? But really the purpose of eating the rich food and feeling satisfied is not just stop right there at being satisfied, but it's to help us grow. All of that word that is being fed to us, that we're, we're learning about and studying and growing through, is, is really what Paul's whole mission is about. As he teaches and preaches, he's trying to give them the rich food that they need to grow. Now, look at, let's skip down to verse 6 in the main text that we're going to talk about uh, this, this morning. Listen to how he, he starts instructing the, the Colossians. This is, this is how he wants them to grow and, and how he wants them to develop. Verse 6, he says, Therefore... As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now, Paul's mission, again, to fill them up with what is lacking to make them mature in Christ. And so now he gives them some instructions to help them understand where they need to go from here, how they can grow. And he says, as you received Christ Jesus, so walk in him. 
Okay? So that's supposed to help me grow. As I received Christ, so walk in him. What in the world? How does that help me at all? <laughs> Why, what is he saying there? Why is he saying that? As you receive Christ Jesus, so walk in him. You know, we're kind of expecting Paul to start elaborating on the word of God that was given to him. We're expecting him to start feeding us with this rich food and all this additional information about Jesus and, and all these things that Jesus has done. This is a new church. They need to learn more. They need to know more. And the first thing he tells them is, as you received Christ at the beginning... So now walk in him. That kind of maybe seems odd to us. As he says, basically, stick to the truth that you received at the very beginning. You know, it kind of maybe sounds counterintuitive to us because really in our society, we're looking for something more, something new, something additional. We're looking to grow on what we learned at the beginning and get into new things, right? We, we're, we're baptized and, and submit our lives to Christ, and then we're ready for revelation. We're ready to learn about what happens next. <laughs> the apocalypse or whatever, right? We're trying to figure out what's next. But what Paul says, as you received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk in him. So think about and consider the reception of Jesus. And... Walk in that reception. Walk in that, that very first belief, that very first submission to Christ. Think about how did we receive Christ? Did we receive Christ because we were really smart in grade school? Is that how the Colossians figured out about Christ? They were really smart in all their Colossian schools, and then they figured out that Jesus was going to send his son to earth to die for their sins, and then they, they no. Did they, did they receive Christ because they were so good, and they did all the right things, and followed all the right rules, and then God shined upon them and said, you are going to be my children through Christ. No. How did they receive Christ? How does everyone receive Christ? Well, we, we learn the gospel. We believe that God sent his son out of love for his enemies to die for them. That we are his enemies. That we messed up. That we failed miserably. That we need God's grace. And we submit our will to his in order to find forgiveness of our sins. We submit our whole life to the Lord because we believe in the promises that he makes through Jesus. So Paul says, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Then he says, rooted and built up in him. Don't just jump from the salvation that we've received to what's the next thing. I got that. I understand that. You know, this is our society. This is who we are. <laughs> we got it. We're good. I don't need to hear that anymore. Tell me something new. Tell me something else. Paul says no. As you received him, so walk in him. Rooted in him. Built up in him. Focus on him and what he has done for you. Our tendency will be to forget that blessing. But if we focus on it, if we focus on it, then our roots will grow deeper and deeper and deeper. And we will become stronger and stronger, and stronger. And look at the fruit, he says, abounding in thanksgiving. You want to be fruitful to God, you don't need to continue to learn all this, 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 and this, and this, and this. You don't need to be very broad. You need to be very deep on the salvation that we've received. This is what we need to flourish. We need a reminder of the humility that we had at first. 
See, the tendency is for us to go back to being stubborn, hard-hearted, rebellious, self-righteous, and to do all the things that we did before. And he says, I want you to remember that day when you received Christ Jesus. And I want you to remember that forgiveness, that submission that you had at the very beginning. And I want you to walk in that. Rooted and built up in Christ. Not in yourself, but in Him. This is the food that is rich. Jesus is the food that is rich. He continues and helps us to understand how to grow deeper and deeper and have those good, solid roots in Christ with a warning and an encouragement. Verse 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The warning, don't go after the philosophies and the human traditions and the elemental spirits. Don't go after the things that are empty, the things that are deceitful, the things that do not satisfy. What does this mean? Philosophies are going to abound after we receive Christ. There's going to be a number of men who'd like to teach what they think they want God, God wants them to do. There's a number of men who will just come up with some teaching in order to be different from that one truth that was given at the beginning. He's trying to tell them, don't blindly follow men into captivity. Notice the word he says. See to it that no one takes you captive. Captivity has a lot of relevance for us as we study the Old Testament and we see the people are taken away into captivity because of their sins. How do we enter into captivity after receiving those blessings? Well, we go after the philosophies. We go after the human traditions. We go after the elemental spirits of the world, and that's a picture of the physical things. And he's, he goes through and talks about that in verses 16 through 23, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week. But all of these things that, are, uh, that, that men are putting their trust in, all these opinions and all these extra thoughts that get us away from what is true and what is in here about receiving the forgiveness of sins through Jesus that we partook of the Lord's Supper thinking about. That we partake of the Lord's Supper every week thinking about. That is what makes us deeper. That is the rich food for us. That helps us grow stronger and established in our faith. As I thought about this, I, I couldn't help but consider myself. And consider how we all need to beware. We need to beware of me. And we need to be aware of anybody and everybody that we listen to that teaches us forgiveness is based on anything other than humble submission to Christ. If anybody teaches that forgiveness is based on how smart we are, about, or based on how good we are, or how righteous we are, rather than based on the forgiveness that God offers to the weak, helpless sinners that we are, and we've got to be very careful. We need to listen and evaluate men's philosophies. It's okay to listen, to hear. You know, as I prepare for sermons, I listen to other people's sermons. I read commentaries. I hear all kinds of stuff and crazy ideas. But I can't follow them down their path. Once I see that they're going away from the truth we have in Christ and the forgiveness we've received. Through his sacrifice. If I stop studying the Bible and I just blindly accept the words of men, if you do that, you just blindly accept what Casey says because Casey does so good, yeah, right, you could be taken captive. You could be led away from 
the truth that you've received in Christ, the rich food, and you could be empty as a result. It's empty deceit that I would be preaching or that others would be preaching if we get away from the things of Christ, if we're teaching things not according to Christ. Then we see, so that's our warning. Then we see an encouragement in verse 9. For in Him, that is in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now pause right there. In Jesus, we have everything we need. And He pictures for us Jesus as the whole fullness of deity. I love those words, right? I mean, it just it makes sense. It fits in with this idea of being full. Christ is endlessly deep because he is God. But he's in the form of man. You want solid food. Well, that's understanding who God is. That's understanding what God wants. That's understanding God's purpose for me. That's understanding who I am and and how messed up I am and how far short I fall from the greatness of God. And all of that information can be found in Jesus. Hadn't this been our experience as we've studied Matthew? I mean, that's been my experience as I've been studying Matthew with you is that in Jesus we have described all the fullness of God and we have described all the the emptiness of man. And God is trying to show us through Jesus where we fall short. And as we study Matthew, I feel short of what I ought to be. And that's a good thing. That actually helps me to feel more full. Because I'm not filling myself with empty things, with false notions about how good I am or how righteous I am. I get those things out of the way so that then I can fill myself with the truth and the solution to my problems, which is Christ. This is what it's all about. Look at verse 10. And you have been filled in Him who is the head of of all rule and authority. (laughs) Wow. In receiving Jesus, the reason why he wants us to go back to receiving Jesus and think about receiving Jesus, in receiving Jesus, we experience the fullness that we've been seeking after. After we received Christ, after we were forgiven of our sins and entered into that covenant with Him in baptism, which the next section talks about, and we'll talk about that next week. After we experience that, we have been filled with everything we need. And now we just have to fight against putting empty stuff inside of us and taking Christ out. And this is what we do if we add in all these human philosophies. Notice he doesn't say... You will be filled if you do X, Y, and Z. (laughs) That's man's philosophies. You will be filled if you do X, Y, and Z. But it says you have been filled in Christ. Isn't that amazing? In Jesus, we have the fruit of righteousness in our bodies. We have everything inside of us to be full, to be satisfied. Our problem is not that God has not given us rich food. Our problem is that we don't realize that it's in us. And we don't see, as we look at our failures, that Christ is the solution. You know, how many times do I look at Scripture and think, yeah, I mess up there, I mess up there, I'm struggling with this sin, I'm struggling with that sin. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to find help with this. I, I don't know if God will forgive me. Well, look harder and you see He does forgive. Christ is the solution as we struggle with sin. He is the forgiveness of our sin. His sacrifice is always there for the humble who seek to submit to the will of God. It's always there. It will never be removed. And as we struggle to grow, we look at Christ and we see God and we understand what maturity looks like. 
And we realize we'll never get there. But that's where we want to be. If you don't feel filled this morning, maybe it's because you've not received the love of God poured into your hearts through Christ. That's ultimately the conclusion that we draw from this. That God has filled. And if you don't feel filled, it's either you were never filled to begin with, or you were filled and then you started putting empty things inside. And you need to realize those things are nothing. Christ is everything. He is the one who fills us. He is the one who gives us strength and motivation. His, his love has been poured into our hearts that we might not dwell on our own failures, but that we might turn around and have hearts that are bursting with thanksgiving to God's glory. We feel full when we understand that we're worse than we ever thought we could be. But that God is also more gracious than we ever thought He could be. Are you full? Or are you empty? His grace has been extended for you and for me. If you're here this morning and you've not received His grace and entered into the covenant relationship with Him, uh, and you're looking for that satisfaction, that fulfillment... The invitation is for you. And you can receive it and you can find the fulfillment that you're looking for in Him. It doesn't mean everything is going to go great for you in your life and that everything's going to be fixed. In fact, life might be hard. But it'll be worth it and it will be the most fulfilling life because you'll know your purpose and you'll have a relationship with God who loves you immeasurably. If you need to respond to the invitation, please come as we stand and sing.